Hello and welcome to this webinar presented by the Connecticut MGMA in collaboration with the Delaware, Maryland, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York, Pennsylvania, and Virginia MGMA. My name is Emily Long and I will be your host. Today's presentation is led by Jed Bollier. Jed Bollier is currently the Practice Administrator for Mansfield Family Practice in Stores, Connecticut. In addition to being a former consultant for a safety and training company, Mr. Bollier has over 15 years of experience in practice management, occupational medicine, and emergency care. He is a member of both Connecticut MGMA and National MGMA. Since joining Mansfield Family Practice, he has guided the group practice to a new electronic health record, achieved meaningful use, and received NCQA Level 2 and PCMH recognition for the practice. He also serves as President of the Board of Directors for Newington Emergency Medical Services. As a dedicated father of three spirited boys, his spare time is spent coaching their baseball and soccer teams. Before we get started, I would like to review a few housekeeping items and let you know how you can participate in today's web event. The viewer window is on the right and it allows you to see everything the presenter is sharing. The control panel is on the left and that is how you can participate in the webinar. The audio panel provides audio information. By default, you have joined the webinar using microphone and speakers. If you prefer, you can join the audio using your telephone by selecting Use Telephone under the audio drop-down box. The dial-in information will be displayed, including the audio PIN. During the presentation, you have the ability to send questions to our staff through the chat box found on the left side of your screen. Simply type in your question and click Send. At the end of the presentation, we will do a question and answer session. As a final reminder, we are recording today's webinar. You can view a copy of this presentation and recording on the participating MGMA website. Please welcome Jeb Bollier with Dealing with Disruptive Patients. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Jed. I'm the Practice Administrator at, at, for Mansfield Family Practice. Uh, we're going to talk about disruptive patients, but I'm also going to talk about potentially violent patients. Uh, many of the unstable patients or patients with poor impulse control that make a scene in your office can also be potentially violent. Um, the ways to prevent both the disruptive patient and violent patients are pretty much the same, but either way, let's face it, being disruptive is an aggressive act. Um, in recent years, there have been several high-profile cases of violent patients in healthcare settings. In 2014, a man unhappy with his mother's treatment entered Good Shepherd Ambulatory Surgical Center in Longview, Texas and attacked visitors and employees. He stabbed one nurse, nurse to death as he tried, uh, and he tried, uh, she tried to protect patients. And there are four others that were injured during the attack. On January 20th, 2015, a patient's son uh, shot and killed a surgeon at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Uh, in September of 2015, a patient armed with scissors and a knife attacked nurses at a physician's uh, regional medical center in North Knoxville, Tennessee. Between 2011 and 2013, workplace assaults ranged from 23,000 to 25,000 annually. 70 to 74% occurred in healthcare and social services settings. While most media coverage, statistical studies, and professional literature focus on more egregious and injurious acts of violence in healthcare settings such as physical and sexual assault and homicide, other acts of aggression and disruptive behavior are also highly prevalent. I'm sure every one of us has experienced this in, in our office at one point or another. Um, while most of the data that I have uh, and that is available is for hospital systems, not private physician offices, we must consider that you're treating the same people as the hospitals, um, as uh, many of the uh, primary care offices are the primary referral source, so the risk factors should all be similar. Um, the goal here today uh, are threefold. We're going to talk about how to prevent a situation from occurring, uh, identify the risk factors to prevent it. When a situation does present itself, we're going to talk about how to properly diffuse it without compromising your staff's ability to deal with that patient in the future, and how to set some behavioral expectations for the uh, patient for future interactions. Uh, to that end, we're going to start by learning about the disruptive patients, who they are, why they're upset, um, 
how to hopefully diffuse the situation and how to prevent it from occurring. I also, I also hope to shed some light on, uh, on other safety issues when dealing with disruptive patients or potentially violent patients. Uh, the recommendations and guidelines for handling violent and disruptive patients have been published in an array of organizations, including Occupational Safety and Health Administration, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the World Health Organizations. Uh, the guidelines focus primarily on identifying risk factors, implementing prevention and uh, mitigation strategies within hospital settings. However, much of those strategies can be applied in office settings as well. So what is disruptive behavior? Uh, everyone has a slightly different tolerance for chaos in their lives. Um, as uh, Emily said earlier, I have three rowdy boys and two dogs. My life is in a perpetual state of chaos. Uh, my tolerance, therefore, for, uh, disruptive, for disruption might be different than yours. Within the healthcare setting, uh, I'm defining disruptive behavior as behavior by patients, family members, patient representatives, or friends that is intimidating threatening or dangerous and may pose a threat to the health and safety of other patients or employees, to um, behavior that interferes with the delivery of safe medical care to other patients at the practice, and behavior that impedes the operation of the practice. It can be considered time-consuming or frustrating behavior to the provider. This behavior can impede the patient's care, can slow down a provider, can cause disruptive, disruption in your otherwise perfectly smooth day. Disruptive behavior may be exhibited in a personal encounter or deployed in any media, including um, telephone calls or messages, uh, emails, web postings, social media, video, um, or in written or printed form. Disruptive behavior cannot be justified by the disruptive person's stated intentionality uh, or the presence of any psychological or physical impairment. The behavior is the, is the behavior. How it affects other patients, staff, and you are all negative and it needs to be addressed. I would advise you to talk frankly with your physicians about identifying potentially disruptive patients ahead of time. Physicians love their various scales, so bring up the ABS, Agitated Behavioral Scale, BARS, uh, Behavioral Activity Rating Scale, and ABC uh, in the ABC Violence Risk Assessment. All of these are effective tools to employ as soon as any patient displays any signs of agitation. Uh, specific examples of disruptive behavior can include, but are not limited to, verbal abuse such as name calling, racial or ethnic slurs, sexual harassment, loud or profane language, um, direct or implied threats. Uh, you might have a patient who's at the window just yelling at one of your uh, receptionists and saying, I'm going to report you to the Department of Public Health, I'm going to call, I'm going to post a bad posting on Yelp. Um, it could be f physical abuse, bumping, shoving, slapping, striking, uh, hitting the wall, slamming a door, um, unwanted approaches towards, uh, towards you or contact with others. It could be a, a, a threatening gesture forward, uh, possession or brandishing of weapons, uh, persistent or intense outbursts. You might have a patient who commonly yells, commonly doesn't want to have their weight taken. Um, they can be very uh, emotional, um, nonstop crying. They're always agitated when they come. They're always terse with uh, the reception staff, the medical assistants, the nurses as they're going through their visit. Um, there are several different types of disruptive patients. Um, all of you have had that patient that frustrates you and your staff, and they come in many different forms. Uh, they could be manipulative patients. Now, these patients often uh, play on the guilt of others, uh, threatening rage, legal action, or suicide. They tend to exhibit impulsive behavior directed at obtaining what they want. The keys to managing encounters with manipulative patients are to be aware of your own emotions, attempt to understand the patient's expectations, which may actually be reasonable even if their actions are not reasonable. And realize that sometimes you have to say no. Sometimes you need to take a hard line rather than placate the patient to keep moving forward. And these interactions, uh, be prepared because they can be time consuming, but you need to make sure that your emotions are in check. Set solid expectations on behavior with these patients. 
uh, frequent flyers. Uh, these patients may stand out due to the number of visits uh, and uh, how familiar they are with the practice. They may be lonely, dependent, or too afraid or embarrassed to ask the questions they really want answered. The first step to a productive interaction is to identify the underlying reasons for the frequent visits. Uh, begin by acknowledging that you notice the pattern of frequent visits and have an open discussion to learn the reasons behind uh, the reasons. These are disruptive in the sense that uh, you're not prepared for them and they can suck up uh, quite a bit of time and impede the flow of the practice and the flow of the patients. If you know that you're going to need more time or your providers are going to need more time with a patient, it's best to schedule additional time for that patient, 30 minutes rather than squeezing them into a 15-minute appointment. Um, grieving patients, the same goes for grieving patients. Help the grieving patients by making sure that they understand that grief is a process, that it takes varying degrees of time for different people. Um, and uh, the time issue is, is always an issue for uh, physicians within the office. They're always concerned about seeing the next patient and a patient that they weren't prepared for can cause a situation. Uh, somatizing patients, these patients also, uh, they tend to present with a chronic course of multiple vague or exaggerated symptoms and often suffer from comorbid anxiety, depression, uh, personality disorders. Some of them have doctor shopped and will likely have a history of, uh, of multiple diagnostic tests uh, that are inconclusive. Uh, the keys to managing these encounters with uh, these patients include describing the patient's diagnosis with compassion, emphasizing uh, regularly scheduled visits with a primary care physician will help mitigate any concerns. Uh, there's a lot of communication that needs to be done um, in order to effectively manage those patients. Um, the last ones are the most common, they're the angry, defensive, frightened, or resistant patients. And this is where we spend most of our time today. They're easy to recognize. Uh, try first to uncover the source of, di of difficulty for the patient and pay attention to the way his or her emotions relate to the medical issues at hand. Define your boundaries and recognize when your triggers are, are invoked as this will help you modulate your response to the situation and allow you to empathize with the patient. Try to use reflective statements such as, I can understand why you might feel that way, and follow with a discussion as to what it might take to resolve the situation. The risk factors uh, for violence and disruptive uh, disruption vary from hospital to hospital and practice to practice, depending upon the location, size, and type of care. Uh, in, in, in an interesting example of a location, I'm close to Hartford, Connecticut, and if any of you have gone to Hartford Hospital, the, pl the place is pretty locked down tight. Security has a presence. You must have a purpose to be in each location in the hospital. Uh, there are lockdown areas. Uh, there's a badge system buzzing you into each area. In contrast, I was recently at a new hospital in Central Maine, Maine General, and I waltzed right in, strolled into the intensive care unit, and only then was I asked by a nurse where to go. There was little to no security. After hours at that hospital, I encountered a uh, security, I'm doing finger quotes here, and she was about 70 years old with a limp. I'm not sure how much security she was providing uh, as she got winded walking down the long hallway. This could be a function of the location. The hospital was rural in a low crime area. That's not to say there wasn't risk there, but there was much lower risk. So some of the common risk factors for healthcare include the following, working directly with uh, volatile, volatile people especially, if they're under the influence of drugs or alcohol or have a history of violence, um, working with uh, when understaffed, especially during meal times, closing times, after hours, when there are fewer people around, uh, long waits for service, that can make anyone grumpy, uh, overcrowded or uncomfortable waiting rooms, if the waiting room is too hot, uh, that can cause people to get agitated and recognize it. So um, I'm actually experiencing that issue right now in my office where the AC is not working properly, my waiting room is a little bit warmer than it normally is. So we have water in the waiting room for patients, we have a fan blowing, when the patient comes in, we apologize immediately for it. So the problem is out in the open. Um, also, if an uh, area is unclean, if there are magazines everywhere, that causes disruption as well. Uh, working alone, people who, uh, that provides people with bad intentions opportunity, and we want to deny them any opportunity. Uh, poor environmental design, that's leaving areas that are unaccessed for an extended time period, such as a back room, um, that once again provides uh, ample opportunity. 
uh, inadequate. Oh, there are some questions here. Yes, uh, one of the uh, individuals wrote uh, that they had a patient with extreme body odor issue, and that was quite a distraction. Uh, we've experienced that as well. And uh, when that occurs, uh, obviously uh, exam rooms uh, are uh, are always an issue. And we had one patient who actually defecated herself in the uh, waiting area, and we moved her immediately into one of the exam rooms uh, with a bathroom attached. Even if the provider can't see the patient right away, you really do need to separate some of those patients because that does cause a distraction. Oh, let's see. Yes, and I'm sure I, we can make the presentation available for other people. Um, Inadequate security is another issue. No locked doors, no security guards, no badge system, no easy exits. That can also be a risk factor um, for disruptive patients and, and violence within the workplace. Um, lack of staff training and policies for preventing managing crises uh, with potentially volatile patients. And I'm going to get into that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, unrestricted movement of the public. You certainly don't want a patient to surprise you in your office. Um, we need to restrict patients' access to the physician offices, to the exam rooms, and uh, um, in other areas within the building. Uh, depending upon how your office is set up, having poorly lit corridors, rooms, parking lots, uh, all of those should be well lit, um, and there should never be a lonely hallway uh, in the building that has patient access. All these situations can create opportunity for an individual to become upset, um, and uh, somebody who is opportunistic um, or somebody with poor impulse control to act out on their frustrations and become violent. Uh, the next slide here, um, this was from uh, OSHA. And uh, just take a look at some of the risk factors that we have here and tell me if this doesn't sound like the healthcare industry in general. Do employees have contact with the public? Yes. Do they work alone? Yes. Do they work late at night? Yes. Is the workplace uh, often understaffed? Absolutely. As you go down that list, Geez, you wonder why we have such a high incident rate of violence within uh, the healthcare industry. So why are patients upset? What might lead somebody to be disruptive in a medical environment to begin with? Um, so what set this person off? Does this person have a medical issue that's a contributing factor? Um, if yes, is it okay to share that with your staff? Absolutely. You do not need to go into detail, but keeping your staff informed and supporting them means that they'll support the providers, they'll support the physicians, and not take some of those negative interactions personally. Uh, remember, if, you're, if the staff is there to support the physicians, we need to give them the tools to be able to do that. Um, disruptive behavior often stems from stress associated with being sick. Patients fear that their health may worsen and experience anxiety about the out-of-pocket costs that they'll incur, uh, but it also might be rooted in mental illness. Um, at reception, Billing issues not being resolved, including being sent to collections. Miss their appointment, they need to reschedule. Long wait times. Um, and uh, some of those things can be eliminated, some of those risks, um, just by communicating with the patient. I'm sorry you're waiting for so long. We had a medical emergency and we needed to spend more time with another patient. Just saying that to some of the patients within the waiting room, you'll get a lot more compliance out of them uh, and they will be much more agreeable to waiting longer. Um, in an exam room, uh, they might disagree with a diagnosis or treatment. They might feel like they're not being listened to because the provider was rushed. Um, they might have sat alone with their thoughts and anxiety in an exam room for a long time waiting. Um, and that's why you don't want to leave a patient in an exam room for an extended time period without checking in on them. Just checking in on them, sorry, the doctor's running a little bit late, just wanted to let you know we're going to get to you as quickly as we can. That goes a long way with most patients. Um, some of the situational factors, um, sometimes difficult encounters have more to do with the circumstances surrounding the encounter than with the people involved. You should be ready to address uh, these challenges when they arise. Uh, for example, literacy and uh, language issues. Primary care physicians uh, increasingly find themselves needing to communicate with individuals whose primary language is different than their own. Try to allow extra time for these encounters. Uh, whenever possible, work with a trained interpreter rather than trying to communicate through a patient's family or friends. Ensure that that interpreter translates everything that is said rather than editing the conversation. And direct your eyes and speech toward the patient rather than the interpreter. 
working across cultures requires a lot of sensitivity to different beliefs about health and illness and um, religious issues and gender issues. You may not be able to culturally uh, be culturally competent for all people, but your goal should be to remain culturally sensitive in all situations. Uh, we have several uh, patients within this practice um, that are from uh, Middle Eastern countries, and being a male, uh, I know not to talk directly to some of the females. Talking to the male um, is, is the route to go. Our values are a little bit different in the United States. However, I'm trying to be culturally sensitive to them. Uh, multiple people in the exam room. Um, the exam room is a pretty small place, and then when you pack in multiple parties in that room, each with their own agenda, it can become very uncomfortable very quickly. Um, so uh, direct your physicians to focus on the patient. Try to keep any family issues or personal issues that would impede care off the table. And time. Um, you might realize, uh, the provider might realize they weren't giving enough time to deal with the, all the issues in front of them. The receptionist might realize that there are four other patients standing behind this individual and they're taking up a lot of time and that causes stress. Um, the patient might not feel like they're being listened to because they're being rushed through each step of the uh, grooming process. So it's a delicate balance, uh, but it is definitely a contributing factor for a patient to get upset. Um, patient behavioral expectations. Uh, it's okay for uh, a physician to set expectations. It's okay for you as a practice to set the expectations. Um, the patients must be made aware that any disruptive behavior will not be tolerated. Every practice should have a patient's rights and responsibility document posted in a visible place and include in their uh, new patient pa packets as well. It should outline the types of behavior that your practice expects, including respect for the providers and the staff, uh, protocols for uh, refill requests, uh, showing up on time for appointments. Um, just as important though, it should also delineate the behaviors for which your office has zero tolerance for, including physical and verbal abuse, weapons, threats, yelling, volatile behavior. Um, use of incident reports is also advisable. Just like the physicians are creating a medical record for a patient, a record of an incident can provide legal protection for a practice and help track a patient who's had mul multiple incidents. Um, listen to the staff. There might be some warning signs. There are times a patient is nice and puts on a great show for the physician, acting sweet and smiling because they want something. But in contrast, they're awful, rude, abusive, and non-compliant with the staff. Document this in the patient chart. Make sure the provider addresses it with the patient every single time. Not after the fifth occurrence, every time. Let the patient know that you and your providers stand behind your staff. I'm getting reports that you're being difficult with my staff. Please treat them with the same respect, respect that you treat me. This is tremendously important. Now some providers, uh, they're healers, they don't want to upset the patient, um, and it's better to address the situation when it's small than when it escalates. And this, is, this uh, speaks to the prevention. Let's see. Um, and uh, it's, uh, this must be portrayed to the physicians and all the providers in your practice. Uh, documentation in the patient chart is advisable. Many EHRs have uh, uh, the post-it note equivalent in the paper chart days. I'm dating myself here. Uh, we would put a bright sticky note on charts to indicate drug seekers, difficult patients, etc. Many EHRs have that same capability. Um, and many EHRs also have the problem list right up front. If there are any psychological issues that staff needs to be aware of, those are the places to put it uh, to flag that patient. And that's just to make sure that you're treating the patient uh, and you're understanding uh, everything that's going on with that individual. Um, training staff. Um, Nothing irks me more than poor customer service um, or a person being rude to me. Kill with kindness. Uh, there are many customer services trainings out there for reception staff, which trains them to de-escalate situations. Most payroll companies or HR companies have trainings available depending upon the solution uh, for which you're signed up. The quickest path to a poor patient experience starts with your reception staff. A rude or inconsiderate reception Receptionist is setting you up for failure. Uh, make sure you're hiring good people. And make sure that those staff are trained to understand any action plan that your um, practice chooses. Um, 
Also make sure your staff knows when to get help. I know I have certain staff members within my office that handle um, disruption better than others. Um, so when they get to that point where, boy, they're just going to continue to escalate the situation, they need to know to come get me, come get one of the physicians. Um, and this is when they feel as though that situation has escalated too much. Now granted, that can be a very subjective feeling, um, that feeling uh, that it's escalated to a point where they are, are emotionally feeling aggravated or, or frustrated or the patient's getting too upset to calm down. The patient refuses any normal de-escalation tactics such as empathizing with them, taking them aside, and the abusive behavior continues. It might be time to get a supervisor. It might be time to get one of the physicians. Uh, unfortunately, this could start that whole process all over again. Um, when it's time for you to get involved, you might want to start by saying, I can see you're very upset, but we're finding the tone of your voice and actions threatening and disruptive. I'm sure we can come to a solution together. We're all here to help you. Uh, the major concern and risk is that the disruptive patient escalates to a violent patient. Be alert. Never let your guard down. Um, chaperones are always helpful uh, for both male and female providers within the exam room. Um, evaluate each situation for potential violence when you enter a room or begin uh, to relate to a patient or a visitor. Um, be vigilant throughout that encounter. Don't isolate yourself with a potentially violent person. Always keep an open path for the exit um, and don't let that potentially violent person or upset person stand between you and the door. That also goes for your office. Uh, too many times I see a physician desk in the back of the office or a practice manager's desk in the back of the office uh, and the patient between the, uh, the individual and the door. While that might look nice, it's uh, not always necessarily safe. Um, so make sure that you have a path to exit if that situation escalates. I've had uh, patients in my office talking about billing issues, and I have a direct path towards the door if I need to make a quick escape. <laughs> um, body language is also important. Don't stand over the patient. Uh, being on the patient level is ideal. A sitting receptionist is more likely to get yelled at than one standing at um, uh, or being at eye level. Uh, I'm a tall, big individual, um, so I can look very intimidating. So when I'm dealing with somebody, I try to sit down um, or try to lean on the counter so we're making eye contact and I become a little bit less threatening to that individual. Um, watch for some of the signals that uh, might be associated with violence, clenched fist, furrowed brow, wringing of the hands, restrictive uh, breathing patterns are all warning, uh, warnings from staff uh, that something is wrong can all help identify uh, these patients. Snide comments, we wouldn't have this problem if you and your staff knew what they were doing. Um, yelled, yelling, raised voices are obviously a bad sign. Um, a patient with a history of drug or alcohol abuse are at a higher risk in this situation, so don't get drawn into a conflict. Um, some primary care physicians ask their patients if they have firearms or access to firearms. So protect yourself with knowledge. You can take a look at that patient chart prior to going out and interacting with a patient who's upset at the window so you know what you're walking into. Um, when you're looking at that patient chart, um, you can't really rely on just a bad vibe or, uh, or, on, a, or on a hunch. Although no one knows uh, your patients like you do, um, you need to know what to look for. Patients with documented acts of repeated violence against others, uh, patients who are arrested for domestic abuse or fighting, there exists a higher probability that they could become violent towards you um, or your staff if they become angry enough. Um, credible reports of verbal threats of harm against specific individuals, patients, staff, et cetera, and that's where that documentation comes in handy, um, especially those incident reports. Um, reports of any possession of weapons. Um, you can look at that patient's belt, see if they have a knife on their belt or if they have a gun holster. Um, that, that's always important to take a look at. And also uh, look for any uh, documented history of repeated sexual harassment. All of these are uh, risk factors. Um, so when it is time for you as a practice manager or practice administrator to get involved, um, first understand that this disruption is going to be time consuming. It's going to be an interruption in the flow of your day and it's going to be stressful. 
Um, take a deep breath. Present a calm, caring attitude. Don't match the threats. When they yell, I'm going to report you to the Department of Public Health, and you reply, oh yeah, I'm calling the cops. That does nothing to defuse the situation. Don't give orders. So don't point, point at them and say, you need to stop, uh, because that is not going to stop them. Acknowledge the person's feelings. For example, I know you're frustrated. Um, avoid any behavior that might be interpreted as, as a being aggressive. For example, moving rapidly, getting too close, touching, um, speaking loudly, um, or my favorite, which is standing tall and puffing out my chest. That just tells the individual that you want to get physical, um, and you don't. The next step would be to remove the patient from the environment that they're in. Take the patients aside who are complaining loudly or being belligerent since they're often energized by an audience. They don't want to look weak or lose the battle in front of people. So taking them aside, why don't we go talk over here or in our conference room so I can give you my undivided attention and we can find a solution together. Um, listen to them. Let them vent for a minute. Blow off some steam. Many people will run out of gas. Um, and then they're more receptive uh, to talking rationally. Your choice of words is tremendously important. You can quickly turn a situation around for a rational person. Use a statement of understanding. I understand you're upset. I understand you're frustrated. You can't be seen right now. Um, add a statement of empathy. I would be upset too if I drove all the way here from whatever town is far away and can't be seen. Uh, offer a potential solution with a question back. Do you want me to see if I can get you in the next available time? Um, and you can tell the patient the whys of the situation. The doctor can't see you right now because you got here after your appointment time. If he saw you, then all of the other patients today who arrive on time would be seen later. And this is certainly not fair to him or everyone else. Let's see when the next time available for you to be seen is okay. Um, also, even though most of the people on this call are most likely practice managers and practice administrators and office managers, you might not be involved on the clinical side of things, but there could be a, a very valid clinical reason that the patient is acting irrationally. Um, a quick side note story, we had a patient who came in uh, for blood work. Uh, we rent out space to a patient service center here and then came to the reception desk complaining about a bill and just got louder and louder and louder. And he was a very large individual, about six foot four. I'll never forget him. And he had a cane and he was waving the cane around. So I brought him into my office and talked with him there and explained to him about, about the bill very calmly and he was just getting increasingly agitated. And uh, I suggested it was time for him to leave. And uh, he stood up and he wobbled when he stood up. And uh, then I, at that point, asked him why he was here said, for my blood work. I said, okay, uh, for what? And uh, at that point, we learned that uh, he had been fasting. Uh, he was diabetic and had been fasting, and uh, he was very ill. And we got him, in, him, him into an exam room. We ended up calling an ambulance for him. So his agitation really wasn't due to the bill. His agitation was due to his underlying health issue. Um, when the situation does escalate, you still need to remain calm. Um, as the um, confrontation progresses, the level of intensity could increase. Uh, the consequences should increase as well. You must remember not to ever threaten the patient. Do not say, if this behavior continues, I'm going to discharge you from the practice. Um, this is where it gets really difficult uh, because you certainly don't want to lose your cool, but most people also don't like to be berated and disrespected and called names. Um, and this is where many people start matching the irate person and escalating the situation beyond repair. So remain calm, assertive. You have, to, you have continued to be loud, and it's inappropriate. Please bring down the level of your voice. I understand you're upset. However, this behavior cannot continue. Let's try to work together. Please keep in mind we're trying to help you. Um, eventually, um, at some point, there's no helping this individual. Um, you're at an impasse. You need to know your limits. For those of you who don't know me, like I said before, I'm a pretty big guy. I can be intimidating without raising my voice. Um, you should never go so far into a confrontation that you do not feel safe. It might be time to call someone better at confrontations with you or call in somebody just different. Um, 
even if that person is lower level than you, but you know that person has a calming effect on people, call that person in. Uh, and that's completely fine to do. The goal here isn't to, um, to win. The goal here is to make sure that everybody is safe, the patient is uh, taken care of, and uh, the situation is resolved. Um, so when it is time, you should definitely uh, uh, humble yourself a little bit and, and call somebody else in. Um, you can also make uh, pretty clear statements to that patient. It doesn't seem as though we're making any headway. I feel really bad that I couldn't help you. We have other patients waiting. Maybe we can talk again soon about this. I think it's time for you to leave. If the patient does leave at that point, super, situation's over. They might continue to yell out the door, or try to get the last word in. Um, for those of you with teenagers, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, don't engage. It's over. Um, if, uh, you might even, if they don't leave, they linger in the parking lot, uh, you might need to call the uh, police. And you might need to repeat uh, that statement to the patient two to three times so it, so it cuts through some of that anger and triggers and hopefully triggers some reasoning. We are contacting the police. Please call 911. Um, after the confrontation is over, it's not over. Um, you might need some time to cool down yourself. That's normal. Um, allow your staff decompression time as well. You all might need a uh, debriefing afterwards, talk about the situation, how you might have avoided it in the future. Um, that's, that's tremendously important because this can be a very traumatic experience for anyone. Um, what are some of the consequences for the disruptive patient? Do they get discharged? If so, you need to provide reasonable notice and continuation of care. Um, at the next appointment, do you and the physician talk about it with them as to set behavior expectations? And I think that's tremendously important. And you shouldn't be afraid of going in the exam room with the, with the doctor. Um, sometimes that really does uh, lend credibility and, and severity to the situation. Say, listen, last time got really out of hand. I'm sorry that it got out of hand, but we need to talk about this. We need to make sure this doesn't happen again. Um, so all of that depends on the severity of the experience and its aftermath. Um, so how are staff going to deal with that patient again? That's part of the de de debriefing. You need to make sure that staff understands, well, that individual is ill. These are the underlying reasons. When they come in, you treat them just like anybody else. Um, and you need to make sure your provider feels safe with that uh, patient in, in an exam room alone again. That's where those chaperones come into play. Um, if the situation got physical, are there any legal ramifications? Um, pressing charges, there's, there's a lot of questions, and you need to assess that and make some decisions after that patient. Obviously, doctors have an ethical obligation to maintain a relationship with a patient uh, once it's established, and you cannot just abandon the patient. Um, abandonment is, is withdrawal from a patient without enough notice, um, so giving reasonable notice is tremendously important. Uh, under those circumstances, physicians are not required to continue treatment if they are not feeling safe with the patient. Um, and they do need to take uh, the appropriate steps. Let's see. Um, keeping your staff, your staff safe. Um, so this is going once back uh, into uh, prevention. So now that we've talked about the situation, let's talk about preventing it. Uh, controlling access. It's important for all staff um, uh, to have uh, visitor badges for visitors, locked doorways. Back doors locked from the outside. You don't want people sneaking in through the back doors. Uh, in my office, I just installed a buzzer sit system from the waiting room. Uh, nowadays, these electronic systems are relatively inexpensive. I, think I got it on Amazon for two doors for uh, $250. It's really not that expensive. Um, patients uh, must be either let in or buzzed in. So now you've created a physical barrier. And my receptionist pointed out, well, people can just open up the window and jump through. Sure but there's still a physical barrier to doing that. Not everybody has the physical ability to jump up through a window, um, and so that, that can be life-saving. Um, you also don't want a patient to sneak up on you and, and come in that back door after a confrontation. Um, calling 911, know the system in your area. We are in a more rural area here, so um, we've had, uh, we have the state police. We don't have a local police department. Um, so it does take longer for response times, and we need to, that's, that's tremendously important. Um, so the staff needs to know what the response time is. Uh, they need to know 
the address, the different locations of the building, um, if the patient's on the east, northwest, whatever side of the building, that's what the police end up using uh, when a patient's outside of a building. Um, and also uh, letting the police know if the patient's armed, uh, what their agitation state is, that they're pacing the parking lot. Uh, all those things are tremendously important for uh, law enforcement. Um, and be aware of the safety and comfort of other patients. Regardless of how well you handle a situation, a loud confrontational patient can reflect poorly on, upon the practice uh, and other patients' perceptions of the practice in you. Uh, they might feel awkward or uh, worse possible situation, they might feel unsafe. Um, so you might need to instruct staff how to follow certain protocols to evacuate, can't get them out of the reception area, evacuate the reception area. Um, so that action plan comes into play, uh, shut doors to exam rooms, shelter in place. Um, if you can't move the disruptive person, move the other patients around them. Uh, have an evacuation meeting place outside of the building to which people can escape, guided by your staff, of course. Um, ours is the corner of the parking lot, uh, which is an easy place to get to. Uh, to prevent disruptive patients and practices, employers should develop a safety and health program that includes uh, the management and employee input, hazard identification, what places are not safe. Um, this should all be part of your hazard prevention program. Um, and you should evaluate that program periodically. Although risk factors for violence are specific for each medical practice in its uh, work scenarios, employers can follow general prevention strategies. All right, and, uh, so what can some of the providers do? Um, some of the physicians, you can direct them to do this or make strong suggestions to them. Obviously, we talked about some of the scales that the physicians can use, but they can also start by coordinating patients with therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, and other clinicians. Uh, I recognize that some of the practices here are not primary care practices. Some might be a pulmonologist or a urologist or cardiologist. That doesn't mean you can't coordinate if you identify an issue. Um, making recommendations to the patient and following up with appropriate psychological care, collecting and analyzing incidents of uh, patient disruption, threatening or violent behaviors even outside of the practice, and making sure that gets to the primary care physician is important. Um, assessing the risk of violence, getting reports from treating psychiatrists, social workers, family members, all of this is tremendously important. And that documentation piece um, is also very important. Uh, provide a safe environment for you and your staff. Um, environmental designs, and this is uh, uh, a normal thing to develop, emergency signaling, alarms, monitoring system, uh, maybe having a buzzer, some uh, security companies, uh, ADT, alert security, um, Tyco integrated security, all of them have a panic button, and they're wireless now. You can install them right underneath the desk at reception. Um, they're not very expensive, and that can link directly to your um, uh, security panel to call 911, call the fire department, etc. Um, overhead paging systems are tremendously important as well. Uh, the old way of doing a code gray or paging Dr. Gray was what used to be used in some hospitals. You can use that in your office environment as well. Um, I'm going to say this only because it's a suggestion by OSHA, although it's not remotely practical in a primary care setting. However, um, Install security devices such as metal detectors to prevent armed people from entering the practice. In a more uh, reasonable way of doing this, um, in this office we have signs up saying that we will not allow weapons in the office. And they're prominently displayed at every single um, entrance for people to see that weapons, smoking, all those things are not tolerated within this office. And we have had patients who have appropriate conceal and carry um, cards bring weapons in, and we say, you know what, this is private property and we prefer not to have that here. Um, we also have had law enforcement officers come here uh, with their badges in their uniform to be treated. In those circumstances, yes, I'm perfectly fine with a police officer carrying his gun. <laughs> That's what they're supposed to do. Um, design the waiting areas to accommodate and assist visitors and patients who may have a delay in service. So uh, having a TV in the waiting room, a digital bulletin board, magazines, internet access, keep them occupied. Uh, also maybe having a separate area for kids. Some people get agitated by kids running around or 
Um, but having like a little play area, regardless of the type of practice, is always uh, advisable. Um, design the physical uh, barriers to private areas. Provide a separate uh, designated staff bathroom, uh, emergency exits, um, enclosed nurses stations, uh, because that creates a barrier between the patients and receptionists. Um, install uh, deep service counters. Um, that's another way of, of doing it. That way a person can't just reach across and, and grab somebody. Uh, arrange furniture and other objects to minimize their use as a weapon. Uh, within our area, all of the reception chairs are moved away from the reception window. And of course, not all of these suggestions are entirely practical, but this is OSHA's recommendations, uh, so I'm somewhat obligated to review them. Um, make sure you have signs such as employee access only, private. Uh, as silly as it sounds, it is tremendously effective. Uh, some of the administrative controls, uh, design staffing patterns to eliminate personnel from working alone uh, and to minimize patient waiting time. I have two staff members who are in the office at 7.15 in the morning preparing for the first patient which arrives at 8. Sometimes we have patients lined up outside. They are not to unlock those doors until there are enough people in the building. Um, so that's just a simple uh, prevention way of, of making sure that uh, A, staff doesn't get frustrated, and B, they're not alone. And uh, restrict the movement of the public by card control access, closed doors, signs. We've talked about that already. And develop a system for alerting other administrators, practice managers, physicians, or security personnel if you have them when violence is threatened. So in summary, um, prepare the provider schedule. Allow enough time for patients who will demand more time. Remember to use the right phrasing. I understand you're upset. Let's work together for a solution. Um, we talked a little about some of the uh, words you should use. Uh, train your staff. Make sure they know good customer service, how to deal with the irate patient, when to contact you, and how to call 911. Prepare your location. Know the unsafe areas of your practice. Make sure your waiting room is clean. Make sure there's enough space. Make sure you have well-lit parking lots. Um, I know everybody's kind of chuckling at this one. Have enough staff. Uh, too few staff can stress out existing employees in raising the probability of a situation. Also, uh, uh, provi uh, provide opportunities for uh, unstable patients to be alone with staff, and that's something that we want to try to avoid. Um, have a plan when things go the wrong way. Um, so you know when you've reached that impasse what the next steps are. Uh, physicians who are burned out, stressed out, and generally frustrated or overworked are more likely to react negatively to patients not just those with the characteristics that may contribute to a difficult encounter. So recognizing your own triggers, your provider's triggers, and knowing what personal baggage we bring into the exam room and reception desk can be valuable. So I hope everybody found that valuable, and um, I am willing to take any questions, and hopefully I can answer them. And I'm looking at some of the questions that we have here. Yeah, we've uh, had some issues with uh, patients demanding narcotics. Uh, in the past couple of years, we've had uh, new providers join the practice, and that usually brings uh, drug-seeking patients uh, into the practice. We have one provider uh, who is board certified in addiction medicine and prescribes uh, suboxone, methadone, et cetera. And uh, some of those patients have posed an issue in the past, and hence uh, our preparedness and high-level preparedness uh, for patients uh, who could become disruptive. Um, that's a great question. So somebody wrote, how do you recommend an office or a doctor or manager respond to a disruptive patient who left them a bad review? Um, one of the ways that we try, we try to prevent that from occurring to begin with, we send out surveys to patients uh, after each one of their visit uh, via email or text so they can rate us. And they rate us on a five-star scale. If it's um, three stars or under, they're allowed to provide us with email feedback immediately. Um, that way we get that feedback. They feel like they're being listened to, and they don't end up posting it on Yelp or Facebook or et cetera. Um, if they give us uh, four or five stars, it directs them to um, 
provide feedback on Yelp, Facebook, et cetera. Um, so we end up getting much better reviews from patients within this practice. Um, but you should respond immediately. Uh, respond on, the, on Facebook or on Yelp. Uh, I'm sorry, you had an issue within the practice. Um, every situation is a little bit different. We invite you to con I think a, a more appropriate venue would be to call the office and talk to us about it directly and open up that dialogue. If you just let it sit there, it's just going to sit there and fester. Yeah, with the stances and the body angles, um, we're lucky in that uh, within my office um, there's a reception desk and a window there. Um, I mean, like I said, I'm a big guy. I can be very intimidating. I do try to get down to that individual's level. I really try hard not to look intimidating despite their um, uh, uh, stances. Uh, obviously, you want to be prepared for anything, but the best way to do that is to get a patient in a room and sit down with them. Uh, that's the absolute best posture to be in is that sitting position. Um, let's see. Uh, somebody asked about dealing with uh, aggressive or abusive uh, patients or parents on the phone. Um, the phone provides some anonymity. Um, and after that uh, situation with the patient on the phone, make sure that the provider or physician and you address that next time the patient comes in. Say, hey, you know what, last time you spoke uh, with our receptionist very rudely on the phone. Uh, I understand you were upset. However, we need to make sure that all of our interactions are professional. Um, so like I said, it always needs to be addressed. Yeah, we've had a similar issue with some uh, discharge patients uh, that they do want to debate it. Um, at that point, your, your interaction with them is, is really over. They're no longer part of the practice. Um, and I, I, it doesn't serve any purpose to continue a dialogue with them. Uh, no, we don't send out the surveys via our EHR program. Um, we actually export the emails and the, um, uh, the phone numbers to another vendor that we use to, to do that uh, survey process. Uh, somebody asked about uh, if we discharge a patient uh, for disruption. Do we recommend uh, that they offer an appeal process? Um, when we discharge a patient, uh, we generally don't do it without some internal debate uh, in the practice. The physician who knows the patient best, they have uh, the first say, all right, we're considering discharging this patient because of disruption, your thoughts on it. Mm -hmm. oh, well, the patient uh, has multiple psychological issues. I don't want to discharge them at this time. Okay, they've continued to be disruptive. Now it's time to discharge them. Uh, so the provider really should be involved in that process every step of the way. Um, we generally don't offer any type of uh, appeal process or anything like that or private practice. Uh, there are a couple of um, – so the next question was, uh, when putting a MOAB in place uh, in the practice, they review it quarterly. Do you have any training tools that can be uh, shared or given to the staff that uh, – outside talking points on aggressive patients, uh, office evacuations, et cetera. Um, I don't. Um, there have been uh, – OSHA has some recommendations on that uh, on their website. Um, recently in the Journal of uh, Family Medicine, they had steps uh, to take. Uh, this was actually an issue in March, uh, the agitated patients, steps to take, take to staying, staying safe. Um, one of the best ways uh, that I've done this in the past is sit down with the staff, um, you know, the managers, the staff, the providers, and go over, okay, what do you guys think are some of the difficult places in the office? What do you think some strategies are? It really should be more of a dialogue to create that, uh, um, those talking points uh, for your specific practice. And uh, some, pe some people have better ability to do that than others. I hope that kind of answers the question. Um, I might be able to provide some links to some of the research that I've done. It looks like I have another question coming in. Uh, great question. If a patient declines uh, the offer to be set up on payment plans or to pay outstanding balances, do you recommend that they be sent to collections and or simply discharged? Uh, we do both in the practice. Uh, this is a business. Uh, we're a private practice owned by the physicians, and they've hired me to manage the business side of the operations. And when a service is provided, we believe that we should be paid for that service. Um, so yes, we send patients to collections, and we discharge them from the, pack, the practice. Um, and that part of that goes to our um, 
payment or uh, patient expectations. We expect to be paid for the services that we provide. Uh, if there's a copay, that's a contract with the patient in the insurance company, and they are obligated to pay that. Um, Deidre, I'm wondering if you were talking about the very beginning of the practice, uh, sorry, very beginning of the presentation when I was talking about the, um, uh, here we go, let's see if I can find them here, my notes. Yeah, um, the uh, scales. There's the ABS, the Agitated Behavior Scale, uh, BARS, which is the Behavior Activity Rating Scale, and the ABC Violence Risk Assessment. I'll repeat that one more time because I tend to talk really fast. Uh, the ABS, the Agitated Behavior Scale, BARS, Behavioral Activity Rating Scale, and the ABC Violence Risk Assessment. I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. The recording will be distributed to all registrants through email. If you attended today's webinar as a non-member, please inquire about membership opportunities through your local MGMA chapter. At the conclusion of this webinar, you will be sent a brief survey that will ask you to rate the webinar on a five-star scale. A separate survey will be sent to your email for a more in-depth look at today's program. That concludes our webinar. Thank you again for attending and have a great afternoon.